the bloopers. This is the bloopers. Oh, this is the bloopers reel. Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, helicopter. Energy analyst Chris Nelder explains how we would jeopardize a substantial amount of future oil supply if the U.S. stopped domestic offshore oil production and how the activity at the margins of supply and demand is really what matters in gauging our consumption. Speaking to the moratorium on, on our domestic offshore drilling, if that were to take place and all this, the rigs were to move elsewhere. There's a limited supply of these, uh, this huge apparatus, you know, to drill a mile down. Once they leave to go somewhere else, it's not like we can snap our fingers and they return That's right. once the moratorium has been lifted. That's right. I haven't heard anyone uh, talk to that point, and maybe you've got a few words to say about I, this uh, potential conundrum. I certainly do. Um, you know, at its peak, I think Transocean, the world's largest uh, deep water, high specification drill ship manufacturer, um, you know, they were building one unit a year. One a year. One a year, and these are rigs that cost oh uh, about five billion dollars to build. Five um, billion. Yeah. So these are very expensive, very high tech. Uh, rigs and a lot of these rigs have been leaving the Gulf now because they can't afford to wait around while they sure. wait for somebody to make up their mind on policy. Right. Uh, not when the rig leases for seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a day. Mm -hmm. uh, that's big money. One day sitting there doing nothing. So those rigs are now leaving. They're going to other places in the world where they are willing to drill. And once they're committed, they're tied up for months. They're tied up for years. They're not right. coming back right. as soon as we change our minds. Right. Uh, so we're really going to lose um, a substantial amount of future supply the longer the <coughs> either the moratorium or the uncertainty goes on. And can you speak to um, an amount that we would be losing um, in terms of domestic production? It's really hard to say how much we're going to lose on account of the moratorium and on account of the spill. Uh, because there's a lot of knock-on effects. You know, you had, you had producing rigs that were operating just fine that were shut down mm -hmm. after the spill. Mm -hmm. When are those coming back? Okay, what, what about the rigs that were about to start drilling, had their schedule canceled and then left? You know, there's a lot of moving parts here that we don't really know what the effect will be. Right. But I think, it's, I think it's safe to say that we've, we've probably lost a 100,000, 200,000 barrels a day of, of forward capacity already, um, and, and it could be more. We just don't really know. What is that percentage of what we use per day of oil in the U.S.? The U.S. uses about 19.7, I believe it is now, uh, mm -hmm. million barrels per day of all liquids. Mm -hmm. uh, so that includes all the natural gas, the biofuels, the ethanol, uh, the tar, uh, the tar sands, synthetic oil, and all that kind of thing. What happens at the margins of supply and demand is really what matters. Um, when oil peaked and U.S. consumption peaked in, in uh, the middle of 2008, we were uh, around 21 million barrels a day. Uh -huh. At the depths of the recession in 2009, I think demand had fallen down to 18.5. Okay. Now we're back up to 19.7, even while we're still deeply in a recession. So is that due to industry moving outside of the U.S.? Most of the decline in fuel consumption in the U.S. was uh, happened in the industrial area. It wasn't that people were driving less. Right. Gasoline consumption right. stayed almost flat through the entire peak and, and collapse and recovery, uh, which tells you that there's very little elasticity in transportation and driving. There's very little elasticity mm -hmm. in, in our gasoline and diesel consumption. Um, 
So most of the loss actually came from the industrial sector. It came from okay. manufacturing facilities not running, things not getting made. We're wanting to get our manufacturing back on U.S. territory. Indeed. Okay, so if that were to happen, would we have um, the resources to supply this manufacturing with the oil that it would need? I think, no, I think a lot of it depends on changing the, uh, the tax incentives that corporations uh, use to choose to offshore so much of their production. Um, some of it has to do with simply labor costs, mm -hmm. uh, tariff structures, things like that. Um, so there are certainly some policy adjustments that could be made to encourage U.S. manufacturing to come back. But the fact is that it's just so much cheaper still right. to make stuff um, in Asia than it is here right. or somewhere else in the world that as long as that remains, as long as the end price remains your objective, right. uh, we'll continue to do right. it that way. Right. So if we were willing to pay more for, for things made in the U.S., then we could bring we a lot of that it. back. But that would certainly take some, that would take some political pressure, it would take some policy changes, a restructuring of the incentives to make that worthwhile. Um, but that's something that, that you know, it, it, it t we spent 30 years sending our manufacturing sure. capacity overseas. It's, it's going to take back. a long time to bring it back. Right. Um, we need to retrain, we need to rebuild, retool our factories. Um, and I think we should. I think we should. I think we should be building all kinds of renewable energy, smart grid, everything else um, in these shuttered auto factories in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, but it'll take a, lot, a much larger um, federal and state and you know, just an overall regime of policy commitment to make that happen. Mm -hmm.